After losing my wife, I found comfort in her sister's support. But a single night shifted our grief into something I can't undo now I'm struggling to honor the past while facing an uncertain future with her. I'm Alex, 28 years old, and I've been living in a haze since my wife Sarah passed away from cancer two years ago. We met when we were just 15, and she was not only my partner but my best friend. Losing her felt like losing a part of myself, and not a day goes by that I don't miss her deeply. Life has been tough without Sarah most days I feel like I'm just going through the motions trying to keep up with my job at local bank, where we both started working right out of college. It's a place full of memories, as Sarah used to drop by my office to have lunch together. Now, lunch times are the hardest part of my day. I often find myself eating a alone at my desk, avoiding the break room where we used to laugh and share our plans for the future. I've been dealing with a lot of depression since she died. It's like a cloud that hangs over everything I do. I struggle with feeling motivated to see friends or pursue hobbies we used to enjoy together. I know I should try connect with people, but it's hard. It feels like there's this wall between me and the rest of the world. The loneliness is palpable. Even when I'm around others, there's a solitude that doesn't quite go away. I used to find comfort in our shared home, but now it feels too quiet filled with reminders of her everywhere I look. Her books on the shelves, her gardening tools in the backyard, her coat still hanging by the door. It all brings back so many memories. Since Sarah passed away, my life has felt incredibly empty, but there's been one constant that has helped me keep it together. Emily, Sarah's younger sister. We've always been friendly, but we became truly close after Sarah's death. Our relationship is based purely on friendship and the mutual loss we feel. Emily has been more than just a sister-in-law. She's been a rock for me in these turbulent times. We started spending more time together because it seemed like we were the only two who could truly understand the depth of each other's grief. Our get-togethers are usually simple. Watching TV, talking, sometimes just sitting in silence, each lost in our own memories of Sarah these moments mean a lot to me, because Emily never pushes me to move on or get over the loss. She knows, as I do, that this is not something you get over. It's something you learn to live with. Emily has been key in keeping me connected to life, inviting me over for dinner, making sure I'm not always alone. We talk almost daily, checking in on each other, sharing how our days went. It's comforting to have someone who understands the significance of a particularly hard day or the anniversary of a special moment I shared with Sarah. There's nothing romantic in our relationship. It's a deep familial bond forged through shared pain and the love we both had for Sarah. My relationship with Sarah's parents has also grown stronger since her passing. They've been incredible, reaching out to make sure I'm not just wallowing in my grief alone. Since I lost my own parents in high school, Sarah's parents have stepped into that void somewhat. And this has only intensified since we lost Sarah. They invite me to family gatherings and make it a point to include me in all major family decisions, just as they would their own son. These interactions are a balm to the loneliness that tries to engulf me. Family dinners at their house are often bittersweet. I see so much of Sarah in them, in her mother's smile, in her father's hearty laugh. And sometimes it's both comforting and heart-wrenching. They share stories about Sarah, keeping her memory alive, and it helps me feel like I'm still part of the family, not just someone who was briefly connected to them through marriage. They often tell me how grateful they are that I'm part of their lives, that I keep Sarah's memory alive as much as they do. It's a mutual support system that works because there's an unspoken understanding of the loss we all share. They've never made me feel like an outsider. Instead, they've doubled down on making sure I know I'm still family. This has been crucial in helping me maintain a sense of belonging and stability. At times I feel guilty for the support I receive, wondering if I deserve it. But Sarah's family has never wavered in their kindness. I try to give back by being there for them as well, helping around the house fixing things. Being a part of celebrations and helping them navigate the world without Sarah navigating these relationships has been one of the few things that has helped make my world feel slightly normal again. I am incredibly grateful for Emily and for Sarah's parents. Their continued presence and support have been some of the most stabilizing elements during the worst times of my life. We've grown together in our grief, finding new ways to connect and support each other, and I don't know where I'd be without them. It was a regular Friday night and Emily had invited me over, as she often did, for some pizza and a couple of beers. It was supposed to be a relaxed evening, just another one of our regular hangouts. We settled in with the TV playing in the background, talking about our week at work, venting frustrations and sharing small victories. These evenings had become a cornerstone of my new normal and I valued them more than I could express. As the night progressed, we ended up talking about Sarah, as we often did. But that night, the conversation took a deeper, more emotional turn. We shared memories, some that made us laugh and others that brought tears to our eyes. The mix of alcohol and the heavy emotion lowered my guards and heightened my feelings of loneliness and longing for a connection. Before I knew it, the atmosphere changed. There was a silence, a kind of charged silence that I hadn't experienced with Emily before. We looked at each other and in a moment that seemed both fleeting and stretched out, we kissed. It wasn't planned or thought through, and as soon as it happened, it led to more. We ended up sleeping together and without a condom. It wasn't until it was all over that the gravity of what had just happened began to sink in. The immediate rush of guilt was overwhelming. I felt sick to my stomach. Not from the beer, but from a deep sense of betrayal. What had I done? 
I had just betrayed Sarah's memory, the love of my life, with her own sister. The guilt washed over me in waves, each one stronger than the last. How could I face her family after this? How could I look Emily in the eyes knowing what we had done? I felt disgusted, completely disgusted with myself. The self-loathing was immense. I couldn't believe I had allowed myself to be in that situation, to cross a line I never even imagined approaching. The night was supposed to be about healing and support, and it turned into something that made me feel like I was undoing all the respect and love I had for my wife. The confusion was just as bad as the guilt. Part of me wondered if this meant something more, if there was something with Emily beyond shared grief and friendship. But these thoughts only deepened the guilt, making me feel even worse. I was supposed to be the one who held it all together, who respected the boundaries of our relationship. Instead, I had just complicated everything in an unimaginable way. After Emily fell asleep, I lay awake most of the night, staring at the ceiling, trying to piece together how everything had gone so wrong. The joy and comfort that these visits usually brought were replaced by a churning mess of regret and fear. What would happen when Emily woke up? What would this mean for our relationship, for my relationship with her family? I knew I had to leave before we had to face each other in the light of day. Early in the morning, I quietly got my things together, left a note saying I needed some time to think, and left. The drive home was one of the longest of my life, each mile a reminder of how far I had strayed from the man I wanted to be. As I drove, the reality of the situation began to fully settle in. I had jeopardized everything about my relationship with Emily, her family, and the memory of Sarah I had crossed a line that I couldn't uncross, and now I had to face whatever came next, no matter how much I dreaded it. Two days after that night, Emily called. She asked if we could meet and talk about what happened. My stomach churned with anxiety but I knew this conversation was inevitable. We decided to meet at a local park, neutral place away from the memories of our homes. Sitting on a park bench, the early spring breeze did little to ease the tension. Emily was the first to break the silence. She apologized the other night, admitting that she had been harboring feelings for me for over a year. She confessed that her feelings had grown from our closeness, the comfort we found in each other, and the shared grief. Hearing her say this was jarring. I had never considered our relationship in a romantic light. It had always been built on the foundation of friendship and mutual loss. Emily continued, explaining that she had struggled with these feelings, unsure of whether to disclose them, fearing it might ruin the support system we had created. As she spoke, my mind raced. Part of me felt betrayed. How could she develop these feelings under the circumstances? Another part of me felt a deep empathy for her, understanding the complexity of human emotions, especially in times of grief. It was a tumultuous mix of shock, confusion, and a strange sense of clarity. I told her I needed to process everything. The guilt of betraying Sarah was overwhelming, and now Emily's confession added another layer of complexity. I was still deeply in love with Sarah, clinging to her memory as my moral compass, and any thought of moving on felt like a betrayal. Emily listened quietly as I expressed my turmoil. I explained how conflicted I felt, torn between the loyalty to my late wife and the undeniable connection that had formed between us. I told her about my fear of losing not just Sarah's memory but also the family I had come to see as my own. Emily nodded, her eyes filled with understanding and sadness. She assured me that she didn't expect anything from me, that she valued our friendship above all, and would hate to lose that. She suggested we take some time apart to think about everything, to figure out where we stood individually and what we wanted moving forward. As we parted ways that day, the air between us was filled with a heavy mix of understanding and uncertainty. The walk back to my car felt longer than usual, each step weighed down by the gravity of our conversation. I was confused about my feelings, unsure about the right path forward, and scared of the potential fallout from our actions. Over the next few days, I did a lot of soul-searching. I thought about Sarah and how much she had shaped my life. I grappled with the guilt of even considering a future where I could be happy with someone else. Especially Emily, yet, there was a part of me that couldn't deny the warmth and happiness I felt when I was with Emily how natural it felt despite the circumstances. I realized that my feelings were more complicated than I had admitted. Emily was no longer just Sarah's sister to me, she had become someone very important, someone who brought light into my life in a time of pervasive darkness. But was it right to explore these feelings? Could I ever move past the guilt and honor Sarah's memory without feeling like I was replacing her? These questions haunted me, each one echoing Sarah's absence and the profound impact she had on my life. I knew I couldn't rush these feelings or the decisions they prompted. The days following my conversation with Emily were some of the most challenging I had ever faced. My emotions were a tangled mess, and despite Emily's reassurances, I felt isolated in my turmoil. My feelings for Emily were becoming harder to ignore, yet every moment of happiness or connection I felt with her was immediately overshadowed by guilt and a deep-seated fear of betraying Sarah's memory. Emily continued to be incredibly supportive during this time. She gave me the space I needed but was always just a phone call away if I needed to talk. This only made things more complicated. Her understanding and patience were qualities that made me admire her even more which in turn intensified my feelings of confusion and guilt. As I struggled internally, I also grappled with how to handle the situation with Sarah's parents. They had become my family in every sense since losing my own parents in high school. The thought of losing their trust and affection terrified me. They had embraced me as a son, 
and now I was at risk of betraying that familial bond. The idea of them looking at me with disappointment or worse, disgust, was unbearable. One evening, as I sat alone at home, flipping through an old photo album that Sarah and I had put together, I felt an overwhelming urge to talk to someone who might understand. I considered confiding in Sarah's mother, who had always been towards me. We had shared many heartfelt conversations about Sarah, and she had offered wisdom and comfort in my darkest times. The moral dilemma of whether to reveal the truth to her was agonizing. On one hand, telling her could shatter the image she had of me, potentially destroying the family dynamics. On the other, the weight of keeping such a secret felt dishonest, especially in a relationship built on mutual respect and openness. I wrestled with these thoughts for hours. The photo album opened on my lap, Sarah's smiling face looking up at me, a silent reminder of the life we had shared. One particularly difficult day, I decided to visit Sarah's grave. I spoke to her as I often did, telling her about my confusion and seeking some sign or guidance. What should I do, Sarah? I asked aloud, hoping for clarity. The cemetery was quiet, the peacefulness both comforting and haunting. As I stood there, the reality of moving on seemed both necessary and impossible. A few days later, I made up my mind to talk to Sarah's mother. I invited her out for a coffee, a neutral place where we could talk openly. As we sat across from each other, the familiar warmth in her eyes made the words catch in my throat. But I had come this far. I couldn't back out now. I started by expressing how much her family meant to me, how they had filled the void my own parents left. Then I cautiously broached the subject of Emily and me. I explained everything. From the night it happened to the emotional aftermath and how conflicted I felt. I emphasized that it wasn't something either of us had planned or anticipated, and how much I valued the family and didn't want to lose them. Alex, she said gently, her voice steady but filled with emotion. I won't pretend that I'm not disappointed. But I understand that grief can make us do things we might not otherwise consider. It doesn't excuse it, but it does explain it. She took a sip of her coffee, her eyes not leaving mine, ensuring I understood the gravity of her words. You're right. You did betray the trust we had in you. But I also know you loved Sarah deeply, and I believe you still do. Her calmness was unnerving, but also a testament to the kind of person she was compassionate, understanding, yet straightforward. What happens now? She asked, her tone implying that while forgiveness was possible, the path forward wasn't clear. I don't know, I admitted feeling a mix of relief and increased anxiety. I need to figure out what this means for me and Emily. I don't want to cause more pain. She nodded, her expression thoughtful. And Emily? How does she feel about all of this? She's confused too? We both are, I replied. She expressed feelings for me that go beyond just caring as friends or family. We haven't figured out what this means for us yet, or if there's even an us to consider. That's honest, she acknowledged. And honesty will be crucial moving forward. You both need to think carefully about your next steps. Not just for your own sake, but for everyone who cares about you both. Her response was a relief, but it didn't erase the complexity of the situation. She promised to keep the conversation between us until we figured out how to move forward. As we parted ways, she hugged me tightly, a gesture that spoke volumes about her forgiveness and understanding. After the confrontation with Sarah's mother, I was left to navigate a new reality. The confession had opened up a dialogue but it also left many questions unanswered about what the future would hold for me, for Emily, and for our extended family. The potential paths forward were uncertain and fraught with emotional pitfalls. The following weeks were a time of deep reflection and careful interaction. I spent a lot of time thinking about what it meant to honor Sarah's memory while acknowledging my evolving feelings for Emily. I wrestled with my sense of loyalty to Sarah, questioning whether moving forward with Emily would be a betrayal or a testament to the complex ways in which the heart heals and adapts. I decided that any step towards a possible relationship with Emily would need to be taken with transparency and respect for all involved. We agreed to start seeing a therapist together to navigate our feelings in a structured environment that would help us understand whether we were seeking comfort in each other, out of shared grief, or if our feelings were building towards a genuine relationship. At the same time, I made a commitment to maintain open communication with Sarah's parents. I wanted to ensure that they never felt blindsided by my actions again. Their acceptance of my mistakes provided a foundation on which to rebuild trust, but I knew it would take time and consistent effort to fully restore what had been damaged. The possibility of rejection from other family members loomed large. I understood that not everyone might be as understanding as Sarah's mother had been. Preparing for that rejection was painful but necessary. I had to accept that my actions might lead to permanent changes in how some family members viewed me regardless of the outcome with Emily and my reflections. I also considered the themes of loyalty, love, and loss. Loyalty to Sarah had initially made me feel that any new love would be a betrayal, but I gradually began to see that Sarah would have wanted me to find happiness again. Love, I realized, wasn't finite. The love I had for Sarah would always be a part of me, but it didn't preclude the possibility of experiencing love again in a different form. Dealing with loss had taught me that life was about moving forward, not moving on. Moving forward meant carrying Sarah's memory with me into any new relationships, honoring her by living fully rather than remaining anchored in the past. Emily and I took things slowly. Our shared history, filled with both deep loss and emerging affection, required us to be patient and gentle with ourselves and each other. We were learning that caring for someone new didn't diminish the love we had for Sarah rather, it expanded our capacity to love and experience life's complexities. As months turned into a year, 
the dynamics within the family had adjusted. Some relatives were supportive, understanding that life had to go on and acknowledging the sincerity of our intentions. Others were more distant, perhaps needing more time to come to terms with the changes. I respected their feelings, knowing that healing and acceptance come at different times for everyone. Looking forward, I am cautiously optimistic. The path Emily and I are on is not without its challenges, but it is one we are choosing consciously with the blessings of those closest to us. The therapy sessions have been instrumental in helping us understand our motivations and feelings, ensuring that our relationship is built on a solid foundation of respect, love, and mutual support. I am determined to live a life that honors all the love I've experienced, the love I've lost, and the new love I am cautiously embracing. Sarah's memory remains a beacon for me, guiding my actions and decisions, a reminder of the preciousness of time and the importance of living with integrity and compassion. Moving forward, my life is a testament to the resilience of the human spirit the complexity of emotions, and the infinite capacity of the heart to heal and love again. The journey isn't simple or straightforward, but it is filled with the potential for growth, understanding, and the continuation of a life that honors both past and future loves. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real-life stories happening around you.